All right, we are live. It always feels like that takes so long. We hit the record button or the live yeah. button, and then there's uh, an infinite wait time. Um, today I'm joined with Callum. Callum, welcome to the show. Thanks for giving up your time. Mate, absolute pleasure to be here. Honoured, honoured. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it is great to have you here, and I'm really excited for our conversation. Um, just give the listeners a bit of uh, an introduction as to you know who you are and and how it is that you spend your time. Yeah, absolutely. I am a nutritionist and eating disorder specialist. Um, I have a background of kind of working in um, performance sport and worked with a, a number of, of kind of governing bodies. And then in 2018, kind of set up for my myself, my own kind of nutrition consultancy and kind of work with a whole spectrum of, of disordered eating still have some affiliation with sport and working with governing bodies on with athletes who have a disordered relationship with food. Um, and then as well as that in my practice, just working with one-to-one -one with people who let's face it, like a, a, who sit on a spectrum of what is disordered eating. Yes. We think of kind of like the, um, clinical eating disorders is the kind of the extreme but then there is so much that so many people just tolerate in terms of just food around guilt, uh, guilt around food and um kind of certain controlling patterns and, and stuff like that so that's how i spend my day today is is helping people athletes a, a bunch of um across a whole spectrum of different styles of work and uh, hopefully starting to unpick and unravel and working towards some degree of, of food freedom too. Great. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's, there's so much to unpack then and, and things we're going to go into definitely. And I think um, it must be interesting working with the athletic sport population, as you mentioned, because especially with those that start to manifest, let's say like disordered eating behaviors, mm -hmm. because that's probably more people than, let's say people who aren't involved in sport would think hundred percent hundred percent and it comes down to i think particularly in um the sports i currently work with british weightlifting is the primary governing body that i work with and you think about a um a sport which is weight making which inherently has diet culture in inverted commas kind of these themes kind of bred within it as well as kind of control weight control heavily based upon weight controlling strategies and, and things like that it's it's a birthing ground as well as just sport being this system which is really dependent on external validation or these external drivers of safety i.e um where you sit in your performance pathway is dependent on other people's performance. It's depending on your coach's feedback. Quite often they have all of these specialists, nutritionists, psychologists, which ultimately provide quite a, particularly as an athlete develops these, a lot of external markers to t that don't really teach it's becoming more of a conversation now, but don't really teach these kind of ways to drive internal validation and it, these internal senses of safety. And so people look from the outside and think, oh my God, I want to be like X or I want to do, um, or they seem to have it put together. Whereas actually, as we know, as I know in particular, th there's so much that can go on underneath the surface that people just don't see. Yeah, I think you know as you mentioned that external validation in particular not just from the coach but with the there's such a a bias towards uh body weight within sport mm. and then i mean olympic weightlifting and uh, combat sports and things where there literally is that weight making element there's that factor mm. and and you know you then have that kind of relationship between body weight to strength ratio where, where am I going to be more, most efficient? Where, you know, where am I going to perform my best? But it kind of doesn't take into account that person's, let's say, their, you know, their natural set point or where they might feel they're most comfortable, particularly with regards to their relationship with food. And so we're working with, you know, British weightlifting in particular. Do you find that your consultative practice is, is more leaning that way to kind of educate the people within that governing body? Look, you know, people are going to have you know, their best weight is going to be where their best relationship with food is. And as an outcome, that's also going to be their best performance because there's going to be that negative effect on performance if people are always, you know, hammering deficits. 100%. Even, and just from a, 
uh, a psychological uh, point. Part of the the points we're trying to raise within the performance pathway uh, are both kind of like like you say, referring to these kind of neurobiological um, kind of aspects around um, set points, stress, nervous system management, um, which have a direct correlation to performance, but also then um, just optimal performance being like, I know that I perform better. Yes, in training, um, obviously I'm not to the volume of, of uh, an elite athlete, but then in business and all of these kind of stuff, just when I'm happy. And a big, big part of it is to have these conversations and and look at what drives the athlete. And then if we can make, ensure that the, the driving mechanisms um, behind the athlete's performance are essentially coming from a place of love then then that's what we're that's the platform in which optimal performance can be built because so many athletes have almost um been uh, pursuing these sports in order to like just this is a very generic statement and it's not true for all athletes but so many come through a pathway learning that they obtain kind of senses of identity and sense of belonging and in many ways, um, sense of love through performing and doing. And so actually they are almost like trying to control their body and their performance in a bid to feel accomplished so that, that they, that they therefore feel enough. And so starting to open up these conversations with the pathway to to notice to ha- to notice red flags both in their behaviors around food behaviors um did a a, a seminar recently with a, um, a group of coaches and look looked at kind of how we can within the scope of what the coach can um can facilitate how we can create our environments to really work with this aspect of relationship with self and and things like that so absolutely it's it's taking into account these these things like set point but also it essentially creating more of a, a process which really welcomes in um the athlete's humanity essentially like to to really just say they are not robots they they can have x y z and actually they can want a life like to be like okay what can it be what what's this person not this athlete what's this person's values and actually if we can start to facilitate and have wider conversations around that then as a result we should see and we are seeing in many senses uh, an increase in performance right yeah that's cool because I think that's always the <clears throat> there's almost that um, that hesitation from a lot of people I speak with where uh, you know there's this focus on um, let's say body composition and as a focus on that they're like that's that's what I need to do to perform at my best is sort out my you know my body comp I need to lose weight I need to um, you know, be smaller, I need to be lighter. And then that will help me be stronger, be better, whether that's weightlifting, whether that's CrossFit, whether that's running, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's held kind of universally as a principle. And people often think if they go through any kind of, uh, you know, self-acceptance and self-love now, because particularly what you mentioned of like, you know, people are using this as a way to kind of feel worthy. Yep if I perform this way, I'll feel worthy. If I look this way, I'll feel worthy. Like I'll be happy when, Yeah. and people are worried, you know, I can account a conversation I had recently with a guy on Facebook where he was like, I'm really worried that if I, you know, work with this person, it'll just be that kind of like, just be happy to be fat type thing. And I'm like, well, what I was like, you know, what makes you nervous about that? Like what, why would that not be a good thing? I don't know if you can kind of talk with that a bit of like, what you know, there's, there's this almost obsession of, of needing to like either look better or be smaller in order to feel better. And <laughs> some would argue that a body composition goal isn't a bad thing, but then can it be a bad thing? Do you know what I mean? Like it is, it's the wrong focus almost. 100%. I think one of the things that ultimately this fear that we have around um, body composition 
um, and around kind of weight gain is essentially almost like birthed from this mistrust with with self and and it's holding it in in balance in terms of like okay well um where's the dynamic of um body fat and performance and actually we know that the reality is quite often a lot of athletes don't really need to be as lean as what they are like and um because body fat serves a purpose like and it has all of this is um it it has hormonal effects on the body that can be, like I say, somewhat positive in, in, in that sense, up to a point. Now, in terms of then the, the management of that from a, an element of, of performance, what we want to do, I'm not, I try and allow a lot of, and protect a lot of autonomy within any client. And I would never tell them what they should or shouldn't look like, what they should or shouldn't do with their body, but just try to guide and prompt. And a bit like what you said with your with the guy you spoke to on on Facebook, from that sense of like, okay, well, what's actually what's actually wrong with that? Because it's not a sense of you will put on weight and that you will have to be happy with being um being fat but actually when there's such this this con this fear around it it will create this heightened response within the nervous system almost like i got to control things and i got to do this and like where's the fear coming from where's the pressure coming from what are the beliefs that are driving that well if i i stay this body fat um stay at this body fat then um if it's in sport then my performance is going to be compromised and even that like I would also call a bit of BS on that too and just say, well, there's something underneath that. And if we're looking at more gen pop, it's starting to underpin how these kind of really controlling tendencies around an idea of I should be X amount of body fat or X, X amount of body weight and these arbitrary random numbers is helping just creating essentially a greater sense of safety. Like, and it creates this, this, path and so why can we not just feel safe in our own existence and don't get me wrong like i can relate to re relate to this a, a lot and just being like okay well actually i know that when i come to my values of how i just want to live life and when i come to um just essentially a way of being i do live quite health consciously I do live in flux with, with all of these things. So why am I not trusting myself? And so I really like to explore through questions around like really basic questions around someone's experiences and modeling and, and things like that um, in the sense of what their ideas around who they had to be and um, how they formed that sense of validation and safety with food and without food in in the in the past and um being in a sense of like okay what are we actually worried about maybe you were someone who um like for example i was someone who really formulated a, a sense of identity through being an athlete in in school and so essentially what i then learn is in order for me to be obtain a sense of belonging then i had to be the athlete and i had to look a certain way and and all of these kind of things and so all i'm saying is that if i put on body fat then i am less worthy of my sense of belonging and there we have a sense of like okay that's where we can uh, that's where we go and that's where we actually just say well actually where do you, what does your pillar of belonging look like? How do we kind of facilitate that within your life? How are you showing up? How are you express, how are you expressing your, um, I would say like expressing your truth essentially in terms of like not having to like setting boundaries and not having to people please, but surrounding yourself with, with, um, relate the relationships that you have and, and stuff like that. And then just being able to, use that as a lens to be like okay well do what you want with food but you don't need to control it because you're worthy of belonging and teaching people that they're worthy in this example worthy of belonging regardless um if that makes sense yeah it does yeah and uh, you know <clears throat> it's a good point as you said about 
obviously there's autonomy of, of person that you know we're, we're working with or, or you know the person who's who's thinking about these things of like look you know it's your body you can choose what you want to do with it but you just need to be aware of the inherent um risk versus reward and also you've got to there's got to be a certain honoring of um like one's genetics their set points and also their priorities their lifestyle in terms of understanding that for some you know getting to a certain level of leanness is more difficult than others be that genetic lifestyle priorities or a combination of of all of the above you know like i could you know i can showcase like okay here's a picture of back when i was a you know an athlete myself and also like a you know a coach and worked on the gym floor but that's not my life anymore and if i was to do that level of activity now it would take away from other areas of my life so it's like what's the what's what's the kind of priority ratio there too um and i like how you put that that kind of like sense of control um and fear around it almost being a nervous system um creating a nervous system response because that's what a lot of people don't recognize is that that obsession with control can have a negative response back can't it like it's that hugging the cactus analogy of like you want enough control Mm -hmm. over it that you feel in control of your own life as you said if i live in accordance with my values i do live this way so why can't i put my trust into that why do i need to over control it's like you know the over control will actually hurt you rather than than help you um the identity piece of an athlete was an interesting thing that you said just at the back end of that callum because I, i you know again something that I've spoken with a lot with people, both Facebook and Instagram recently is this, this idea of, well, I want to look like I train, you know, I I want to look like I, I I train a lot, you know, I'm an active person. I want to look like that. And I'm like, that's really interesting. And I, and and it's, it's trying to help other people realize that that's other people's problems yeah, because it's that, it's that um, stigma that's created by the outside world of like anyone with maybe, you know, a bit of adipose tissue or fat tissue, sorry, is therefore not someone who exercises frequently, which is just obviously horseshit. Yeah, it's completely uh, the level and the level of expectations in terms of um, what people place on themselves, particularly with we get like devices like social media and and things like that. These days are, um, yeah, somewhat un unrealistic for many for many senses but also in a a sense you raise a really wonderful point in in the sense of just be as going through this this process and kind of asking the question of like okay well what's the cost of that like if you were to invest more time in your your fitness and and health like what's the cost of that on your business your relationship all of this kind of stuff and that doesn't even have to be from business and relationship but it's just asking the question okay if you are going to if i'm working with particularly athletes um and that athletic population if we're then engaging in a a process one of the first questions we ask is along this process what do you want to protect what what are you what are we protecting what are we not compromising because is it worth it obtaining xyz if if we're we're um if we're compromising huge areas of our lives and and not living in accordance with our values and 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 things like that and so yeah thinking about these kind of um these senses of what's portrayed i don't want to say um what like you say what someone shouldn't shouldn't be but i also don't want someone to base what they want based off of what's out there I want you to be like you to just exist how you want to exist. If it, if particularly as a, if we're talking in the context of male, like a, if, if I want to be a man who can back squat 250 kilos and is, is like I say, really like physically strong in that kind of masculine way, have at it. But actually if I want to be um, exist in a body, which is just carries um, a bit of body fat and I can express myself in more creative ways. And this is very generic and I apologize, but the being more creative ways and you just live in truth of your own existence. And so it's exploring and just, and like um, we've had conversations before, just being curious to being the sense of, like, okay, when I feel that desire, like to um, 
pursue something, whether that's business or physically. I have a quite a neutral approach to my body these days. But um, so particularly, I always find these urges to like, I need that like, um, that kind of pursuit of like a, a fitness challenge, if you say. And, and I don't judge it. I just observe it. And I'm just like, okay, where's that coming from? where what's the undertone of that and can just kind of begin to just sit with that and explore it and be like okay what's what's going on there maybe i feel as if i'm stagnating in some some areas of my life or maybe you know what like i need to push myself and and that and it is coming from that place of 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 love and i'm not just seeking discomfort because i feel inadequate because i feel less than and so i'm going to try and prove myself and i've done that and um and i probably i did an iron man last year and that was a, a something that came from a place of love that was something which was really just learning new skills like when i first got on a bike i was like a dyspraxic chimpanzee and or I would, like i say learning all of this and just this experience of being out in the mountains and and stuff like that was amazing um but I've also done pursuits, CrossFit competitions and other physical challenges where if I do this, I will be enough. And so it's just observing, like when you feel that desire to, oh, I need to lose weight. I want to be this. Okay. Just be curious with it. And we don't do that enough. No, we don't. You're right. It's, it's almost like a, it's just a blanket statement of I, I want this thing. And, and then you, you know, if you're ever kind of challenged on it, it's a case of like, well, I just do, you know, it's like, can we go a bit deeper into those desires? Mm. How do you know, like that journey, you know, physical challenges and that journey of things like how, how do you know where that place is coming from as someone, mm. you know, cause I I've done them, but only for like raising for charity, raising money for charity. Like I did a triathlon years ago and then that was just for, that was just to challenge myself in something else. Like it was purely a case of like, I was doing CrossFit and I was like, let's just do a triathlon without training and see how it goes. Nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a sprint triathlon. So it wasn't like, it wasn't an Ironman or even a full length tri triathlon, but uh, you know, and, and in previous things I've done purely to raise money for charity. Because mm. it's like, and, 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 and annoyingly it's like as someone who's, um, you know, quite a fit bloke, I've always felt like I needed to do something a bit more out of the ordinary to raise money for charity sure because otherwise i felt people wouldn't wouldn't donate do you know what i mean like that's kind yeah. of my maybe i'm wrong but i remember signing up for a 10k back when i was a crossfit coach and people being like ah surely that's like that's really easy for you like why should i donate <laughs> so i i set up a thing of like every every 10 pound i i made from donations i put on it like a, a kilo weighted vest <laughs> nice end up running the 10k with like 30 kilos or something so i ended up like raising 300 quid or whatever Amazing. and that was fine because it was it was just a plod but you know with you with yourself and your own journey how could you tell that that big kind of physical challenge was from a place of love versus a place of let's say like control or fear or the want to change something physically I think it it comes um, a lot. So there's a lot of things I really like through my own sense of of work of really, um, I really like starting to listen to what kind of goes on in my body. Like if I'm thinking about certain pursuits, I I think about like this. It's that kind of um, the way in which I'm generating a sense of action and a sense of certainty because quite often we go from there's this kind of an emotional patterning model called the infinity loop and quite often we go from on one side of the loop are emotions that generally disempower uh, disempower us the sadness anxiety like there's just part of the human experience um and then on the other side of the loop our emotions that empower us and that can be anything from frustration compassion anger etc cetera, etc cetera, that kind of get up and go and take action mm -hmm. and quite often just as the way of the human experience we naturally travel over this and it, it occurs on micro levels and macro levels and so usually i i notice okay when am i making that decision making am i making it when i feel like a bit 
lethargic and a bit like almost like disempowered, like um, whether it's um, yeah, depressed. Like I use that in inverted commas, um, having had depression and, and even what I would use label it now. Um, just that kind of dip, when I say depressed, I just mean that depressed energy mm -hmm. and, or am I coming at it from a place of like, do I feel sad? And then I'm making a decision in that. Um, and then also listening to the undertone of how I, the, how I then get control. Because a big thing, if you look at this on a very common micro scale, the way in which we go through this, it can serve us, right? Like it's part of the, the loop in which we use to, um, to, uh, approach lifts in the gym you go from a kind of a, a, a say a, let's just say a neutral state or a disempowered state you put like i've seen some amazing um snatches that you've done you put 115 on the bar or whatever and then you go connect with a state of empowerment whether that's through anger whether that's through whatever and then all of a sudden you're in, in a state of certainty where you're at least going to attempt the lift and then the most common thing you see is the sense of like, okay, well, I'm in this state of empowerment of like over the course of a week where I'm like, oh, I'm so fat, I'm so this, I'm so that. And then Monday comes along, and it's like, F it. Diet starts Monday, it's Monday today. And no, there's nothing magic about Monday. You've just decided, you've just used something to change your emotional state. And so if I'm coming at it from a place of that kind of like, more angry like certain strong man that for me i know because of the ways in which like i say this is personal to me i know that that's usually um not a healthy thing for me because i'm trying to prove myself to be strong and i know that particularly around my own kind of patterns of, of eating disorder mm -hmm. um experience and my own kind of challenges with my own mental health that there's almost been there's a side of me that is the there's particularly through an internal family systems model we talk about the different parts of us right and there's there's a part of me that um that is a really powerful part that really desires to be strong and it's got me some great places but the deny the the we call it almost like the light and the shadow the shadow side of that strong part is that it's denied me of um i'm not very good at receiving love because strong people don't let love in I'm not very good at vulnerability i'm not very good at um yeah i'm not very good at restful behaviors because strong people don't rest so I know for myself, because of, of my exploration around that, mm -hmm. that actually um, a big, big part of what I want is I want to be seen and I want to be heard. Like, I want this part of me to be recognized. And so I, I kind of just hold up these lenses to my own intentions and being like, what do I really want here? Mm -hmm. Like, I listen to that undertone. I listen to where it's coming from. Am I feeling like when a, a what how am i making this desire where's this desire birthed out of and then i'm noticing okay when i do i'm curious i just i st allow myself to just walk this path and i allow myself to just notice like what am i what how does it feel and um and yeah and am i just wanting do i just want to show up on this on this recording to you and 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 have you just go like uh, what I see in Callum is this really strong, like centered man. And if it's that, then I'm like, actually, like it's not coming. Uh, what I'm not doing is I'm not witnessing my own strength. I'm not internally validating myself at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually going to outsource it. So when I go to, when I show up here and be like, oh, by the way, I'm doing X, Y, Z. And I've got this plan for the end of the year. And like what I'm wanting is to go on, like, come on then, Johnny recognize me here buddy and um and that's not the he the healthy the the healthy side of it so there's a lot of feeling within that i appreciate but it's it's just a, a curious and reflective process yeah it is yeah and like because you know like he hearing you speak about it you know you can kind of recognize um the thought patterns and you can kind of think to yourself okay like it's it's that it's that marker between like internal and external validation of like okay I want to do this physical challenge or have this performance-based goal because I uh, enjoy it 
and and also I'm going to enjoy the process of training for it. And, mm. you know, that's, you know, part of my identity is that, you know, is, is being involved with that activity, right? Because mm. I think I think what we forget a lot of the time as well, and this is, this is paraded about in the fitness industry, is just this idea of like, oh, well, therefore, you know, if I just train as 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 that person or if i just train as as hard as i can then i'm i'm going to kind of end up with with that result you know yeah. people do all of the squat mobility and squat programs in the world but then still might e- never end up with you know a triple back bodyweight back squat it just might never happen for them despite them sticking with the process in in every way shape or form and if all of the kind of worth and validation both internal and external is tied up in that then that could lead to unhealthy behaviors you know this is what we see with with men and women with regards to let's say taking performance enhancing drugs both from a a strength position but also from a body composition position because it's a case of i want this goal to feel worthy both with myself and for other people to say hey you know like look at like look at all of that hard work you've done it leads them to unhealthy behaviors to get there and then it's a case of like well then is that coming from the right place probably not no. And, and 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 that's interesting isn't it like particularly when you work with people who let's say have um weight cycled up and down and you just, you know you talk with them and you and you say you know where's this this idea of, of getting smaller coming from particularly if the body's continuously fighting against them to kind of bring them back and maybe beyond and and then they're doing behaviors that don't match their values each time to get down to a smaller body weight and it's from that sense of external validation and i do feel for people who have larger bodies or who are you know just genetically a bit bigger because they're constantly told that they don't fit in or they're constantly told that they're not trying hard enough or that they don't want it enough and and just nothing could be further from the truth yeah oh completely like the the ideas of um the ideas of that is just particularly what's perpetuated in um society is such a uh, the, I used a word the other day, like in terms of um, we were talking about um, neurodivergency and it's such an a, ab- but we do live in such an ableist society. And, and yes, we were talking in the sense of like neurodivergency, but that goes in terms of like how we should just be able to, and they don't see necessarily the human and also the senses of our own, uh, our own, modeling and, and conditioning and just being compassionate to it's all compassionate to actually there's always um there's always a, a purpose so if we are struggling with like you say those weight fluctuations and we're struggling with incon- inconsistencies with our emotional state um or all of the rest of it there's a purpose going on but actually what we're portrayed in the media and what we're portrayed in social media and all the rest of it is that actually what's normal is just to be consistent and put together and, and all of this kind of, all of these kind of things was actually, even if you, and again, coming at it from a, a, a psychodynamic lens, even if you had a really safe and loving experience, the, reality is that there are still markers and experiences that that disconnect us from or don't give us i say correct like there is a correct way but an empowering model of certain emotions like if we're not modeled things like um certain states of empowerment and we're not held through them like particularly because our a lot of our emotional regulation patterns are uh, are learned through co-regulation through our environment and our parents and our teachers and and things like that holding us through these experiences then uh, how could we like if we've had a as a very generic one if we've had experiences as children who where it's been like go to your room when you're in a state of like anger and, and, and things like that, that almost teaches us that we are um, almost not welcome here if we are in that state of anger. And so as a result, then when we experience that, it like in our nervous system response, it almost feels unsafe. And so there are, so we either repress that and 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 push that back down or we go and um quite often it can come out in quite passive aggressive behaviors and really like controlling behaviors and um 
and yeah, quite sometimes quite bitchy behaviors. And so quite a common one in like, particularly people who struggle with eating disorders and disorders eating is that they just don't know how to harness anger properly. Like they don't know how to experience anger in a, a controlled way. And because if, why would you know how to um, overcome an urge, so to speak, if you can't connect with a state of empowerment, if you can't connect with emotions like anger or compassion so many people particularly with disordered eating are so compassionate to other people but struggle to hold that for themselves and just having and this this message put out that it's hugely individualistic your modeling like will be so different to mine and that's part of the beauty of the human experience but then as society puts it, we should just be the same. And you've got to be, this is the blueprint that Johnny needs to fit in. And if he doesn't fit in and he's trying to fix himself to that, that sense of being was actually whilst doing that disregards a lot of the experiences that an emotional, um, skill set and granularity that is ultimately missing essentially yeah fascinating um you know particularly everything about the ability to express emotions as a child it's interesting when you start looking at that if you've never looked at it before and and it, it comes back to that kind of like you don't know what you don't know really do you like yeah. everything that everything i'm now thinking about parenting future children of mine comes back to like how am i letting them you know express themselves how am i letting them like figure out things in the world how am i you know congratulating and praising them and, and what kind of mindset am I creating with them and, it, and and it's interesting to know the level of impact that that has you know particularly like I've not done um a psychology degree like a, a, as yourself but you know like even just reading into relationships you know how people act in relationships are models of their you know parents level of like communication and attachment styles and all the rest of it and yeah. and this kind of like it's interesting the kind of the healthy versus unhealthy from a place of attachment boundaries showing showcasing of love and and it does come back to that you don't know what you don't know and i think that's why the 21st century is so interesting with health and fitness because you have a lot of people on social media who are very well educated and well read who can look at like you know the um spectrum of human emotion and and being and all the rest of it and and say look like okay this is you know this is science and this is psychology and this is healthy and this is unhealthy and i think that's the issue we find with disordered eating and eating disorders yeah. is that a lot of the like quote unquote healthy behaviors are actually stemming from a very disordered place yeah and 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 it's like disordered eating is wrapped up in a bow of discipline and you wonder, is that because of the people who didn't know what they didn't know in the kind of older generations passing on those unhealthy habits and not being aware of where they themselves are getting them from? And it's just, it's really interesting, that whole dynamic. 100%. I I mean, this is a very generic statement and it's not com uh, completely true. But if you look at, say, um, the what we're having to do almost as a generation, I there's huge elements of a, a world war that essentially we're still recovering from in the sense of if you, if you think about a time where there's so much uncertainty and so much lack of safety and you're con and many people are confronted with the idea of rations around food. And then also as a society, that foundation of stability within income and not to mention, um, the the threats of of on our mortality and, and stuff like that and then coming out of that then where there's this birth of this essentially post-war society then people are like well how do i formulate a sense of of safety and belonging and 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 wealth and all of these kind of things and it was 
through the inception of like particularly as we come become more and more industrialized through the the rise of fame and the the rise of the media communicating the message and then the rise of tv and it became through these kind of beauty ideals and through the rise of like capitalism and and, and stuff like that so there's so much that kind of comes from that that our parents have had from their grand their parents and their yeah. parents yeah that there's this messaging of of all of these different things in order to be worthy in order to be that and, and i can be compassionate to that and can be um but it's just acknowledging these all of these systemic things these family things that, that are personal to your experiences personal to my experiences and um on all of this kind of stuff and part of the things that we do teach that as a, a generation is um this idea that in order to be compassionate to something we need to comprehend something and that's a big big part of the the issue like that we we see in so many different um elements of society the whether it's looking at things like lgbtq plus and femin uh, feminists and all of the rest of it is that because there is some form of a disconnect because i don't understand you you're not worthy of my compassion was actually we need to make it the other way around compassion first and then comprehension. And that then plays into ourselves. Like, and it, and it, it makes sense. Like for me doing my own work, well, I can remember just certain sessions where I'm like, ah, oh, I get why I am the way that I am. And all of a sudden there's this birthplace of so much more compassion and now what I've come back to is if things show up for me in all of my imperfection, in all of my like humanity, in all of my struggle and my, I'm just like, I don't need, I, almost I don't need to know the reason why. I just know that there's a reason. And this is, this is here for a reason. And then I can start to connect with that compassion for myself. And then I don't fight it. Like, and then I'm able to not, I don't, you don't overcome an eating disorder, you dissolve it. Mm. And so these parts of the, these parts of um, our conditioning that show up, like I just allow them to dissolve and through not trying to control them and, and just curiosity and, and other things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. Like, it's so interesting how you brought up the, the war and, and then how that kind of affected everything below it. And and because I I chatted with someone about that the other day, about and we were talking about scarcity around food and relationships with food and messages from parents and you know like clean plate club and all the rest of it and we were like well you know if if our parents had parents who were in wartime, you know they had as you said rations and food scarcity and all the rest of it and to now be in this very different food environment is a very different thing to then give someone the permission to leave food or throw yeah. away food like you know in that time it would have been like completely you know immoral and an disregard for the kind of situation they were in yeah. versus where we are now it's very different and also the trauma that was created in that sense you know let alone you know we talk about men being men and strong and leaders and not receiving love and you know like there's a big thing of like you know men men don't cry and men are strong and men are tough and you know men went and fought in the war and yeah. you know you, you've got to think about where has this come down into this this kind of like discipline um show you know show your strength type thing and it's and it's so funny when you and, and not funny but sad like when you look at like let's say the very toxic masculinity culture that can be out there now that's almost still wanting to you know fabricate those ideals and you think well were you know were men okay back then like if you look at like them from a mental health perspective you know like look at the issues of alcoholism and you know uh, abuse in in families and, and still that that goes on to these days it's, it's all a direct result of those kind of traumatic experiences and hand-me-downs of emotional uh unavailability 100 percent, 100 percent, and it's like you say it's just coming to that sense of um these these strategies that we generate like to talk about the, those kind of idea of like being a man and being strong and even being a man who disconnects from his emotional experience like that will serve you in a world war like i like it serves everything that we do serves us at one point in, 
in our lives. And that's on a very generic level, like on a systemic level um, in a, a kind of a war, but also on a micro level, like everything we do serves us at one point in our lives. But then what we have to do is to look at it in the sense of, okay, well, well, how does that serve me now? Is that in line now? Like that particular sense of we almost like learn that pain creates urgency, that kind of link between the two. If I've got the emotional vocabulary and the emotional skill set of a teenager, as an example, then and where I'm not truly, I'm figuring myself out with emotions and I've, I'm not really able to articulate, I don't have the vocabulary, I don't even have the ability to connect. And I was actually massively disconnected, particularly as a teenager. So I learned that if I've got uh, an exam that I know that I'm going to revise two days before the exam because I'm, I'm got a high level of anxiety. And, and so actually, and then what that learns is, and this was part of my own journey was I had to go, okay, can I actually, so I love going to the gym. I love being health conscious. I love kind of just being active. I love playing sport. Can I actually trust myself to go to the gym if I actually like what I see in the mirror? And just to be like, oh, right, okay. So I was driving, the, there's almost like these psychological patterns that drive me to this, this sense of like, we only have trust to action when we feel pain attached to it. And it's like, okay, no, 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 no. Like that served me really well to achieve a, a foundational of academic success and to achieve, um, I was played quite high level uh, rugby when I was younger. And, and it allowed me to achieve a decent case of sporting success. Now I am an adult and now I have greater levels of self-awareness, emotional granularity and, and all the rest of it. Does that serve me? And it's like, no. And so again, just being compassionate and being like, okay, what, how do I want to show up in that sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like the constant question of like, does this serve me now versus did it serve me then? Yeah. like the, the, you know different needs is so powerful and, and interesting like i feel like the decisions that teenagers have to make that they're like not emotionally equipped to deal with is massive like a you know gccs a levels university choices like all the, you know like you're supposed to know your career when you're like seven, sixteen, seventeen. 16 yeah. 17 it's like you know come on get fucked but it's yeah. it's that oldie again like it's a different the 21st century is so different in terms of the technology and the opportunities that are available compared to 50 years ago I mean, compared to 10 years ago, you yeah. know, like, and, and, and the way of living is, is very different now in terms of the, like, oh, you know, go to school, work hard, get a job, like, you know, marry your childhood sweetheart, live in a house that's just down the road from your parents. Like, it's a completely different world now. And we, we kind of have to move with it. And it's, in, and it's interesting, as you said there, the, the differences in what, what serves me then versus what's serving me now. And I mean, let's, you know, it's interesting that we've, we've talked for, nearly 50 minutes and we've talked a lot about you know psychology and disordered eating and eating disorder um pathology and kind of symptoms and things but tell us a bit about your own journey there then through these things because you said to yourself like um being a teenager I played a good level of rugby mm. since then obviously I've been involved in performance sport you know weightlifting and 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 that's led you obviously down into being a nutritionist yeah similar to myself so tell us a bit about your own battles with the kind of dark but both i guess the positives on the darker side of those things yeah absolutely the um i think i am in the career that i am now is a byproduct byproduct of essentially trying to solve my own problems like i'm a 16 year old boy who was playing um international age grade rugby and but was overweight but then that served, had a good degree of athleticism um, and was very kind of like, for me, if if we're talking about the root of this, and now I would just say a 16-year-old is not aware of this, but um, I learnt in my childhood kind of behaviours, if you like, that in order for me to be... Um, belong in my family to be safe to be loved then I had to be kind of like put together I was the eldest of two boys um and was was very kind of as at, through my parents divorce I was very protective and so um 
so within this, there were, there's this recipe where I was essentially not taught how to hold my humanity. So when there were these parts of my anxiety that were really showcasing or my overwhelm that we naturally experience, um, then that would drive me to eat essentially. And a big then part of that for me, particularly around my body image and my particularly, I had a like, horrible, horrible um, beliefs about my body at 15, 16 years old. And I can remember some quite visceral memories surrounding that, um, that my body image was almost like a physical representation of everything that was going on in the inside. And so whilst I was putting on weight, it was like, um, it was like, you can see my humanity, which I had learned that was, was unlovable. And so that's kind of where it started. And so in order to fix that, what a 16 year old or a 15 year old does starts going to the gym. And then I start to have some kind of success within that. Um, and then as I progressed through rugby, things became more and more controlled and like still something weren't, wasn't quite right. Um, and then in order to then solve my problems even more, I was like, oh, I'll go and get a sport and exercise science degree. And it was around that time where I was at my late early 20s, rather, where I kind of lost the contract that I was playing. Um, and I was taken, had this period of time between certainly 18 and 21, where I was in a controlled environment, ate around a lot of people, had the support of nutritionists, was living in my identity of being an athlete and being strong and all of the rest of it. And off, off the back of that, that's where a lot of eating disorder behaviors kind of manifested um, and, and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, from there, it's, it's been a, I did some initial work. I, there was a lot of like, um, particularly at the age of 21, there was deep, deep, deep depression, deep, deep, deep depression. And um, a lot of circumstances that surrounded my family and, and, and things like that. And that's one thing that was not spoken about is that eating disorders have one of the highest mortality, if not the highest mortality rates of any mental illness. Um, and that comes through obviously health complications um, through extreme restriction, but also just through mental illness and, and death by suicide and, and things like that, um, which I can relate to as well. And so there began some kind of, um, yeah, really strong restrictive tendencies, but also huge, huge bin tendencies. And so how it manifested in food was like, like I say, just what it wasn't just a yo-yo of a phase of restriction. It was strong, deep restriction. So I was really suffering and then like huge binges. And when we categorize binges, like it's hard to, because they're very much subjective, but they were 15,000 plus calories easy some days. And, and then over consistent pe periods of time. Um, and so, yeah. And then it's just been a case of unraveling. I like as a nutritionist, like I think food can be a really great gateway into healing our relationship with self working with clients. Now it can have a very nutrition centric approach where you get, we work through things like exposure therapy and, um, and just safely exposing ourselves to food environments and, and, and things like that, playing around with different meal structures where we have to start to really expose ourselves to external, um, internal rather forms of, of validation and allowing a scope for more decision making and and exposing to ourselves and asking the question of what do I want our relationship with food to be? Whereas a lot of my journey, I've never really done any food centric approach. I've just um, realized I was fortunate enough quite early on to realize that food was never the issue here. It was actually food was there as a, um, uh, a protective part. Um, it was there as something um, that was um, a means of avoiding other parts of myself that were that felt too painful, um, and it had a purpose. And so, 
because I recognized that it had a purpose, I was like, okay, well, I'm not necessarily going to go through the lens of, um, like I say, traditional nutrition. I just kind of existed because there were periods of time because I was a nutrition, like, like I was going through a, like a, a, a masters and, and stuff like that. And, but fucking struggling with food, like whilst that was quite problematic on one senses and really challenging, um, and forced me to take up like breaks in my, and like miss exams and, and take things like that. Um, yeah, I was like food. I, I was still to the standpoint where food's not the issue here. I just need to learn how to regulate. I need to understand like this question of who I want to be and just to play around with those things. And as I've gone deeper and deeper and deeper into those kind of ideas and explored them, the, and it got to a point where the, the binging just didn't stop. I didn't need to, I allowed myself to expo, uh, um, experience emotion and to, um, to not judge it and to be more compassionate. And as soon as I developed those skills, then the binging just stopped. And I allowed, and I was a, a bit more kind of, um, and I was so much more consistent with that. Um, and then I, like I say, it's a constant evolving. I mentioned just before we started that um, I then coped in other ways through, because I had this strong intellectual understanding of intuitive eating and um, the balance of um, internal and external validation and all the rest of it, that I almost use these as a markers of like self-protection. And it's only been in the past kind of 12 months or so where I've really been like, okay, I've got to this point in my life through essentially trying to solve my own trauma and on the way it's been amazing i've had some amazing experiences i've achieved things that i wouldn't um question but it's all driven from a place of self-protection and now i'm like okay and i'm still figuring this out who do i want to be how do i want to what do i want to do if i don't need to protect myself anymore um and so yeah it's been it's been a a, a journey journey of also just a, allowing um, food to be a, a real vessel in my life as well to be like okay food is a massive creative outlet for me I love cooking I love all of these kind of things and just giving myself permission to to do that as well and to explore that that sense and th these kind of as a byproduct have decreased um, allowing emotional eating have decreased my binging and, and things like that that's an interesting point I mean obviously a lot of what you said was you know, really, really fascinating. And I want to dig a bit deeper as well into it. And um, But what you just said there about allowing emotional eating, like decrease your binging. And I think that's fascinating, isn't it? Because again, this, I think, I think this is also stigma to people in larger bodies or with, with a bit, you know, more body fat than let's say like a slim person, because everything just comes down to needing to be slim for whatever reason. And, and you've, you know, alluded to the kind of media changes and all the rest of it that happened over the last 50 years. But you kind of have that guilt of any emotional eating as someone who's larger to be like, oh, well, that's clearly my issue. Like, I need to stop all forms of emotional eating and therefore I'll have the body that's worthy. And of course, that's yeah. not the case. If anything, it makes it worse because you have that guilt associated with emotional eating, which makes the guilt worse. And it's like that awful emotional eating cycle. Whereas actually, if, as you said, if, if you if you. I mean, it, it, the work is is multifactorial, isn't it? Because there's a part of being able to express your emotions as a rational like healthy human being while also understanding that emotional eating is part of the human experience and, mm -hmm. and can be a conscious choice when you want it and then owning it when you do so. How old are you now, Callum? 32. And so you were in your early twenties when it was like, I've got a real issue with food here and, and, and you were actually studying as in a master's yeah. in, was it, was it a master's in sports and exercise science? Which yeah, is nutrition. nutrition. Yeah. And so it's interesting, that isn't it? Because you said, that, like, I'm, I'm doing what I do now because I've kind of always tried to solve my own problem. Yeah. And and it's it comes back to almost what we said about people who are in the fitness industry often uh, display the like biggest disordered practices. Yeah. Red flags <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but, I, but that was but that was mid twenties, you know, and late twenties, Johnny. 
Do you know what I mean? Like my yeah. early nutritionist days were that mm. for sure. Yeah. People there, uh, yeah, like I say, if we open up this this conversation, and don't get me wrong, like I think because of this wider conversation, like people are being more compassionate to that, but there's still a lot of arses that are just kind of perpetuating these these narratives, and it just comes from a lack of, and I say this really compassionately and with no judgment, but a lack of just self awareness to be the sense of if you're like this is what you're going, this is what you've got to do, this is how you've got to got to be. Like as you know, there's no right way, and then also, particularly if we're coming at it from a very quantitative approach, um, into or quite a binary approach, then just being curious with that as as well. Because like even if we look at that 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 sense of the people in a larger bodies as an example and demonizing emotional eating, mm. well actually one of the things that like yes, if you look at people who have good um, uh, long term weight management, people who are by quote unquote successful dieters um, who diet and keep their the weight off for a fixed period of time in the research, like yes, there are certain behavioral habits that. Um, center around kind of protein consumption, uh, micronutrient consumption and stuff like that, that, yeah, are good to build into your life. But then similarly, there are things like people who um, have good long-term weight management have a decreased um, perception of reward value around food. And actually within that, they permit a wide variety of eating intentions and, and things like that. The key word, I say this all the time. The key word in relationship with food is relationship. Like the, if you think about a, a, a the most intimate relationships that we have in our life, um, platonic or romantic, they meet a variety of different needs. Like if you go on a, if I was to go on a first date with someone, then I acknowledge, oh, they might meet meet a need of fun. I had a really good time, and then on a second date, I oh, they seem really adventurous, and I actually I feel as if we could share that. Then on the third date, I open up a bit more, and they hold it really well, and actually they meet a, a need for comfort and intimacy, all of these kind of things. And so it's the same thing around our food. And so, but most most of us try and eat for if we've got binge eating tendencies, then it's quite it's either for either practicality or just sustenance or, or, or just because and comfort or for, you might have the, the PT who's like, I eat just for nourishment, I eat to fuel my body and all of this kind of stuff. So even, and I don't want to demonize that. And I would say like, think more expansively, but actually what can we do then to promote then a wider range of think thinking about why we eat because this will keep uh, this will allow you to um develop better strategies for long-term weight management like i eat because so i will eat after this so that i am adequately fueled for my training session this afternoon i will eat um so i can reconnect to my childhood you know what i've had a really hard day and i just need some joy in my life and mm -hmm. so I'm going to eat to do that. Or I've had a really hard day and I'm going to do something really kind for my body. And so what I'm going to do is nourish it in a, in a way. And I've, and just thinking like of that, we should try and expand it to 20, 30 different reasons why we eat. And the, the, we, that plays into the permission piece, like giving mm -hmm. ourselves unconditional permission um, as well as just then, allowing food like food triggers every sin single sensory system within the body mm. like it is a huge tool that allows decompression in our nervous system like you can't fight that and so actually then allowing food to create an experience like this would be so much better if we were sat across of one another sharing a coffee and I would choose a carrot cake. It would create more of a, a literal experience. And so there we play into this piece where we can realize that we are humans. We're here for the experience. We are driven by our sensory the our sensory patterns and the way they're stimulated and not stimulated. And, uh, and then by virtue of that, our relationship with food becomes uh, so much better. Yeah. And I think, as you said, that's the bit that's missing for a lot of 
people who focus on improving their nutrition is the relationship with it and where it serves and the purpose of it uh, again from a from a multitude of factors you know you gave that analogy of, of being you know having a dating experience over several dates you realize the different kind of purposes or you know the, the needs that may fulfill mm. and and with food it's like as you said there's almost that binary like food is fuel you know you wouldn't put you wouldn't put uh you know crap petrol into a ferrari so like yeah, you know yeah. this is like you know shut up yeah. um because it's 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 taking away the other areas that food fulfills and as, as you've you've alluded to kind of intuitive eating and um you know embracing that and and going through that discovery like as you said like oh you know i'm still figuring things out and it's like you know very much same here yeah. and i think that biggest thing about intuitive eating which is which is lost on people is that body food congruence of that discovery of um, okay, well, how how you know does food actually make me feel? And in yeah. different scenarios, what food is right for me? You you've just said I'm going to eat now to fuel my afternoon training session, and that's cool. Like that's the rational thought element of it. And the, then the uh, okay, yeah, I've had like a crappy day. I'm going to indulge in a bit of you know cake because I really want to, and I'm going to own that decision of doing it yeah. while also having other areas of your life that do bring you joy and comfort and soothing. It's like it's having a toolbox. That's it isn't it and 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 this is this this is what's lost on intuitive eating annoyingly because people don't understand it they don't read into it they don't have that level of desire to read into it because it's against their current bias and it's fine because i was there too yeah you know as you said like i've, I've got nothing but compassion for people there and it's interesting isn't it because I, I sometimes think about older particularly male fitness professionals who are still very much entrenched in kind of diet culture you know, and, and very masculine lifting kind of ethos is, and they must be thinking, you know, you and I like, Oh, what are you, you know, they're just a pair of like woke 30 yeah. year old lads. And you, and you just laugh because you're like, well, but are we wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll see you in a, <laughs> I'll see you in about 10 years time. Yeah. The, yeah, like the sustainability of that is, is, is challenging and, and people do do it. And, and again, like I do not want to judge people if their idea of like, particularly masculinity as a concept is to be like I say, a 250 kilo back, back squat or to be shredded with abs and all the rest of it. Like, cool. Like you do you, but make sure you're doing you and not you're doing what you've been taught to do type or what you think you should do yeah exactly yeah um, so yeah it's it's completely right and said with no no judgment within that no and uh, you know with with your own journey through that as well Callum like when you were an uh, when you were doing your master's in nutrition you having to take time off exams and things because you were struggling with things that badly what was the realization for you to be like I've got a full-blown eating disorder here Ooh. you know were you diagnosed by someone else was it a self-diagnosis through your own study was it years later when you look back and thought I was in the midst of one then and didn't realize it like what was that uh yeah well I uh, I fought it a lot I fought it um like it was like just solve my problems find a new training program find a new diet I need to do this this and this you become more red um because an eating disorder is a is a white girl's a uh, young white woman's disease essentially or illness um and so I, yeah, I, I was when um, I sat down with, it was, I went to see someone about essentially depression and then it was them that was, that kind of spoke about it. And even in terms of like, I, I even kind of somewhat, yeah, I, I, I struggle with even the words eating disorder in the sense that it kind of, really polarizes them to like like i say something that's really clinical but then i would i i just think it's it's something that just needs to be more cons more all consuming and it needs to be like non clinical it can be body image concerns um doesn't necessarily have to be diagnosed the bdsm have all of these kind of set criteria with um a certain amount of food in a certain amount of time and i definitely ticked all of those boxes mm. um certain fears around weight gain and all of the rest of it um but actually 
let's just let's just say like talk about our subjective experience um and so yeah it was it was done in answer to your question it was done through essentially a a, a loose diagnosis by a um a mental health practitioner that I was, I was i was seeing and was doing some kind of like cbt stuff with um yeah which uh which kind of kicked me off on on my uh journey i guess and then just really but even within that i would just really hide it like i wouldn't really talk about it there was almost like this acceptance with it within myself but um yeah showing up as i like i think about as i became more prominent on in my own kind of practice and trying to develop social media and and, and stuff like that like i particularly i look at some of my posts around <laughs> 2018 um 2017 the time when i was maybe 2018 when i was doing um the uh, mnu certification and i just like <sighs> i still kind of wince a bit and because that was a time <laughs> where that uh, was a time where <laughs> you and i both <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, where i just kind of uh yeah, just grit my teeth and I can remember that place that I was in where I almost felt like like you go into that environment and you want to be this, like, I've got all of this knowledge already and there's so much of this that I'm learning and it's kind of bringing, it's conceptualizing some of my knowledge in in, in kind of a really good articulate way and there's there was a good community of people within the, the cohort and stuff like that. But then... Um, and I, but I just didn't want to be this guy of like, I felt like a fraud there, you know? So that kind of imposter syndrome, as it were, has been with me like, yeah, whole life, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's <laughs> looking back at, at those years as well, like even, even the start of this podcast for me, like I can look back at, kind of a lot of uh, episodes back when it was daily and, and there was like a shift, um, a slow shift through like very macro-based yeah. fasting, disordered eating, fat loss-based advice into more like values-driven, you know, like hunger-based fat loss into much more like intuitive eating, kind of more anti-diet culture and and – a, a, you know, like we, we chat at the beginning of this of like almost being like, you know, do what you want with your own body. Like even intentional fat loss for a lot of people now, like I'm very, I'm very wary of kind of giving advice around. I'm very much like, let's just become intuitive eaters and let the chips fall where they fall type thing yeah. and build, you know, build healthy behaviors that again, match your lifestyle. You know, we chat at the very beginning of the episode of like, what's the cost of including new behaviors versus the other things that are priorities within your life. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting how you look back at yourself there and think like, holy shit. Like I was kind of like in the midst of it there and it was more of a mental health practitioner who'd assessed you in certain ways to say like, by the way, these kind of ticking boxes here, was that what led you down your psychology studies? It's like, I need to kind of understand this more from a root cause. Yeah. It, and that was part of, that's like part of my um, problem no, well, what I say problem, but yeah, I mean, so essentially what's not spoken enough about in eating disorder recovery is grief um, and a whole grieving process. And so I came to this kind of like ability to like started noticing difference. And then this, I basically developed an, uh, an ability to intellectualize my emotions and my experience as a almost as a means of disconnecting from the experience oh right okay so you're like almost like noticing and naming them but then almost like keeping them outside of you still yeah i know what i'm in i mean I'm, yeah oh like, like this is fine like i yeah. understand it therefore yeah. i can deal with it type thing exactly and so okay. that was so that was all the birthplace as well as seeing the impact that i had the what i'd experienced and then it's like the 12 steps of uh, this 12th step of an alcoholics anonymous is to help another alcoholic and 70 percent of people who don't complete that 12th step relapse into uh and, and stuff like that so there is value right. there right, is yeah. value in it um 
But then, yeah, it didn't really come from uh, a good place. And then part of the most recent work that I've done over the past two years has been um, essentially just being the idea of looking at um, looking at some of my experience. And I can remember a, a session with my current practitioner eight or ages ago that I work with, or it might have been my supervisor. I can't remember. Um, anyway, I remember this session because we were talking about this time of depression. We were talking about eating disorder, like peak time. And he was telling me like, what do you make of that time? And I, and I was kind of giving it the answer. Like, well, if I had to, life happens for you, not to you. Um, if I had to go through that to get to where I am now, kind of doing a job that I find great meaning in, like a level of stability, a relationship with self that I'm kind of really proud of, like I'd go through all of that again, which is true. However, he goes, okay, that's, a, that's an amazing thought process. And I just want, he just goes, I want you to take a deep breath. And I just want you to just, when you think of that time now, like just ask when you think and you think of that life happens for you not to you time kind of idea just ask it to leave and i just took a deep breath and i started crying just like that and i was just all of a sudden my body was like full of just so much grief of like all the the difficulties the life that i'd wasted in inverted commas, like the, I can remember being at a wedding, my friend's wedding, and it was just one of the worst experiences, like the experiences that I'd lost, the relationships that I'd lost, the, the even just the sense of like having to um, miss exams and, and, and stuff like that, the, the financial like avoidant patterns that I generated and just how much difficult, more difficult that my life had been. Um, and I don't say that as like a, like that's any for anyone with any mental illness, but it was just that grief. And then also then grieving a, a version of me that um, I was still working towards, like to be like, I was still trying to be this guy. I'm still trying to be that. And I'm still trying to um, be noble and strong and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm, And in my mind, there's a version of him that exists. And there was just so, and people, like I say, don't talk about particularly grief enough in that process. Like letting go of what you think you should be is so hard. And um, and it is in many ways resembles so much of a, a, a grieving uh, grieving process. And you can feel like, like, no, I have to be this. It's that the first stage of like denial and anger and, and the, the kind of the grief, the grief model. Um, you get to bargaining and then you get to acceptance and all of this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, it's been a sense of like, um, it's been a, a sense of like really unpicking that and mm. just really being like, okay, I'm so, because I'd, I'd used to come up for the mindset of I'm so grateful for how strong that younger version of me was mm. and which is true but and this is the duality of human emotion like i can be i can be in i could be grieving now but i could be here present and joyful with you and and just to be like i'm so grateful for how strong he is which is true i am i see how strong he was but i'm also sorry that he went through that mm. and i'm really sad that he went through that Mm. And and just being able to, that's the emotional um, skill set is being able to hold this, um, like, like this, um, it, the experience of, of emotion across all, like, how am I right now? I'm connected to you. Like, I'm, I feel joyful um, somewhat. I feel present, a bit overwhelmed, <laughs> got a, like a bit, it's a bit, tired and all of these kind of different things and so reconnecting with that experience and learning those kind of things would be um yeah would be something to uh something that's really helped it in in that sense yeah yeah i can imagine and then you know thanks for sharing that i think there's definitely that that duality of purpose of um eating disorder pathology like that people need to 
accept as part of their recovery of the kind of like purpose it served and how it was helpful in a way yeah. and soothing in a way, but then also hurtful in a lot of other ways. Mm-hmm. And like, interesting that you had that perspective of like, you know, life happens for, you know, you. for yeah. you rather than to you. And you were kind of holding that like very stoic almost perspective of it. Yeah. And then, and then it was taking the, it was, it was embracing that kind of grief and sadness for the bad side of it for yeah. you, you know, to kind of give you the full spectrum yeah to then be like i understand but i'm also sad because it it, you know it didn't need to be that way no but then on another like let's say a positive and also realistic spin all you know all paths have led you here you know and you're you're now in a position where you're doing this work and you're you know having conversations with me and you know you've got your own podcast and you've got your own clients and you're helping in such a more powerful way i can imagine yeah you know than younger callum yeah, hundred percent, and it's the it's all it's all true. It's everything, and that's the that's the point that we that's part of like particularly people who are overcoming disordered eating is embracing all of that um, that idea that yes, like I can want this and I can want that. I can want there's a multitude of different truths that we try and hold on to, and actually what's the one that wants to serve us right now, but we just, as opposed to just being like, this is what I want and and all the rest of it. I want to lose fat and I want to stop binge eating. Both can be true at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's kind of getting through that to to think like what's going to be the best route for me. Yeah. 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 And uh, Callum, you know, I'm conscious of your time um, from, from being over, you know, overrunning my own schedule just because of the, kind of chat that we're having so we'll we'll call it a day there um you know thank you so much for your you know your honesty and and vulnerability in today's episode i've really appreciated it um where can people you know find out more about you where's the best place to send them to yeah absolutely there's my website which is callumstronach.podia.com and then there's um yeah, all my Instagram, social media, LinkedIn, Callum Strong, anywhere, connect, wherever you want to come. Great. Well, I'll put that through in the notes as well uh, of the episode. So thanks again, Callum. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, mate.